why the 183 billion dollar video gaming industry can't quit microtransactions i don't know if this is talking about from the consumer or if this is talking about from the company because if it's from the company it's it's pretty cut and dry why stop if it's not broken you know what I mean? Everybody continues to buy microtransactions, whether it's DLC, cosmetics, an actual pay to win game, something along those lines. So I'm curious. Let's let's see what we got. The two biggest video game makers in America now make most of their money, not from people buying games, but on subscriptions and spending within those games. 100%. Fact, Electronic Arts and Take-Two Interactive both make a staggering 75% of their money from what's called microtransactions. You've seen examples of this revenue generation from top titles like GTA 5, NBA 2K, and Fortnite. They come in the form of battle passes, membership programs, and virtual currencies. This is all happening despite intense backlash from consumers and critics, and as the cost of developing these games reach staggering levels. I just find the trend so tacky and wearisome from toe to tip, but it ain't going anywhere because it sells. Exactly, and that's what it is. Like As long as people continue to buy the stuff, they're not going to stop it. I mean, we've already seen a cutback as far as at least here in the U.S. on things that are, you know, gotchas as far as like loot, uh, like the loot crates or any kind of like Gamba system. They're definitely trying to get rid of. Uh, but I mean, <laughs> they're not going to do it until their hands are forced. You know what I mean? In fact, it has been selling. The revenue model conversation has generated so much attention that parties are now trading high stakes lawsuits over the issue. Epic Games Fortnite created its own in-game payment system for microtransactions, and that caused Apple to remove the mobile app from the App Store, ending in a lawsuit in several court proceedings. Apple now has to give its users access to rival payment systems and app stores in the European Union. There was quite a bit of pushback from especially the, the very dedicated gaming community and and rightly so in a lot of cases, you know, a lot of those models, the early models, it was tough to get the things you want. So here's how microtransactions and live services took over the video game industry and why gamers really can't do anything to stop it. What we got, let's see it. Microtransactions are any virtual transaction you make inside a video game that costs real money. In Take Two's NBA 2K, you can purchase virtual currencies for various prices. Dude, and what's crazy, I mean, I didn't get, uh, what are we in? That would have been 2K24, I guess, was still the previous one. I didn't do any of this. Um, but their VC is absolutely insane, man. From when, at least from when I used to play, like, if you wanted to get a character to at least like a decent, like, 91, 92 overall, you were spending this 150 bucks from the ground up like it, it is absolutely nuts what they did with 2k buying the battle pass in fortnite each season or approximately every three to six months grants you new skins as well as the i don't have a problem with battle passes if i'm going to be completely honest with you where i have a problem with battle passes is when companies put out a game and charge a price for an incomplete game and then expect you to buy a battle pass on top of it or when a battle pass has any kind of actual pay to win advantage that's the only time i really have a problem with the battle pass I usually don't mind spending money on games that I'm going to play a lot just from a battle pass perspective because if I'm going to play it a lot, I might as well get the cosmetics that usually come along with it or something cool. I don't, I don't mind battle, battle passes as much as everyone else does, to be honest. To purchase its own virtual currency, V-Bucks, the highest selling console game of all time. G was, was Fortnite? Fortnite wasn't the first thing to instill like its own in-game currency in V-Bucks. There's no shot. I mean, I, I guess I could be wrong, but... No way. GTA 5 allows gamers of GTA Online to purchase a GTA Plus membership for $5.99 a month. Prior to, say, um, 2012, you're looking at 98% or more of content spending being done physically. That all began to change when people started to get more connected. And that allowed publishers to do new and different things beyond just selling a disc, including, you know, not just digital downloads, uh, but also things like subscription services. In 1971, the video game market was only the computer space arcade game and took in $1 billion in revenue. Fast forward to today, and the market's worth $183 billion. Well, and what a lot of people don't understand is that the biggest gaming market is actually right here. It's actually your phone. A lot of times people think that the gaming market is, oh, it's a sweaty PC player or it's a it's a console player. It's It's not. The biggest gaming market in the entire world is phones. Is mobile games and they are the biggest gotcha spend money for and and i don't even want to say gotcha i mean there's a lot of gotcha mobile games but when it comes down to like just pay for convenience 
mobile 100 percent hands down like if you didn't grow up like right like i grew up playing clash of clans mobile phone game boom once you got to like town hall level three things start taking forever to make but you know what you can do you can buy gems or you can buy things to instantly get it done like they their pay for convenience is a lot crazier than i think pc and uh consoles billion dollars with various platforms and thousands of games. Mobile gaming has played a massive part in the expansion of the industry. What's driven the growth of the gaming market has been the, the growth of smartphones. Now in 2023, you've got 80% of the world's population using a smartphone. So, you know, we just have, you know, 6 billion plus people with a device um, that is capable of playing you know, some kind of game on it. So we're just able to reach so many more play people mm -hmm. with games See? today than look there it is man somebody right there my boy in chat hundred dollars on gems i don't i don't think i spent any money on clash because i was too young like i didn't have a job and my dad definitely would not have gave me money to spend on clash of clans but that's what i mean just it's, it's a prime example like we all spent a whole bunch of money on that stuff i'm town hall 12 there it is i think that's about where i stopped um taking off on there yeah back in 2007 the live service models within you ain't these mobile me with games that, dude. on the cash ain't counts. Me. And now the industry leaders want to bring more and more of that model to console and PC gaming. Live services refers to game publishers work to continuously provide new content throughout the game's life cycle, which popular titles like Fortnite, Apex Legends, and League of Legends have. 80 year old white men who are worth billions are probably not playing mobile games, but their grandkids are. And when their grandkids are, are you know, billionaires, they'll still be playing mobile games. And certain executives are banking on it. Take-Two Interactive President and CEO Carl Slatoff and Strauss Zelnick were paid in total $72 million in 2022 Ooh. after revising their compensation packages to include for bonuses for hitting microtransaction goals. The microtransaction trend isn't go Shit, fellas. We made it. We made it. Good old Rocket League. Going anywhere. As Electronic Arts brought in $5.6 billion. I honestly, I think Rocket League's, um, and, and again, I'm not even trying to be biased because I like Rocket League. Like, a lot of their stuff that you pay for is, I think it's pretty fair. I mean, it, I, don't get me wrong. I guess the, like, actual money bundles that they've come out with. But back in the day when it was, like, you know, if you want, if you were lucky enough to get a Titanium White Octane to drop out of something, it was, like, 600 credits. You know what I mean? Like their stuff was usually fairly priced. The black market stuff was like 20 bucks. Most people only bought one, maybe two black market things. Like I didn't mind their, um, like the price of their cosmetics. Some games are obviously ridiculous, but it's all relative to the community. I spent so much now on Rocket League. I'd love to know how much I've spent on Rocket League. I really don't think it's a lot. Even with like, we look at my inventory. I don't think it, I don't think I've spent over a hundred dollars and I've played that game pretty hard. 3000 hours since like 2017 dollars in its latest earning results, highlighting the resilience of this evergreen business model. Yeah, I mean, because when you look at it, like especially mobile, like it's only growing. Phones are only getting more stronger to play better games. I mean, look, we basically have Call of Duty running on iPhones now with Call of Duty mobile. And what's insane, and this is what's even crazier. Is it's the best call of duty that's out right now like it's freaking nuts man they know what they're doing incorporating um spend opportunities and paid games offends the user because they're like i already paid 70 bucks for the game why do you want to charge me more this frustration and backlash to in-game purchases is nothing new it brought controversy in Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion with the infamous horse armor for $2 back in 2006, and it still is today. Traditional gamers would say, you know, I want to buy a great game in order to play that game. I don't want to feel like I'm being nickel and dimed, you know, along the way. After negative feedback before Electronic Arts' release of Star Wars Battlefront II in 2017, Elder Scrolls started the all decided scumbags. against its own iteration of in-game purchases, which many labeled as pay to win. I, I'm going to be that guy right here, and this is going to piss probably a lot of people off when this gets uploaded to YouTube, but I love the crates. I'm going to be honest. I love it. I think it makes for really good content, and it, it's a form. Yes, I get it. It's a form of gambling. Don't be fucking stupid with your money, man. Nothing was better than watching John Sandman uh, hit the loot boxes and stuff like that. And all the Counter-Strike people. I mean, dude, the dopamine hit that you get when you pull out a gold, like you just see gold and you're like, I, I'm, I got it. Like I, 
and, and yeah, and like it is predatory, but like at the same time, man, like you need you know what you're doing. You know what I mean? Like I I'm sorry. I I'm more against the pay to win stuff. I think pay to win, especially in a game that is already paid, like if you have to actually pay to get in and play the game and then a pay to win on top of that, I'm totally anti against that. But any of the gamba and the crates, dude, I, I'm sorry. I, I like it. I like it. I'm guilty of it. Gamers who buy games have this code, which is kind of not very well thought through, but it, it, that they hate pay to win. The Battlefront 2 release was also marred by loot boxes, which are packages of content gamers can buy to enhance their experience via costumes or playable characters. Sure. Loot boxes weren't just an issue for gamers. Hawaii's legislature wrote a bill to ban them from video games in the state. Whole countries have altogether banned loot boxes. They believe the loot box is too many ties to gambling. It's the chance factor. As long as there is no pay to win out of the loot boxes, I don't give a shit. I think it's totally out. Not very well thought through. That dude's probably never picked up a controller in his life. Yeah, I mean, you can't say it's not very well thought through because who gives a fuck if Hawaii puts something in or one of these small countries? Like, like nobody cares about that. Like, oh, man, we're missing out on 0.001% of the market when your entire market for these games generally is the entire world. Like, yeah, it, it was pretty well thought out. Uh, that guy's obviously, yeah. Um, I only ever played the first Star Wars Battlefront and I loved it. Yeah, I mean... I and I, when Battlefront 2 came out, I didn't even mess with the multiplayer, so I, I can't tell you if the loot boxes were pay to win or anything like that. I hit the campaign, and I didn't go back and start playing multiplayer until like a couple years after it came out. But dude, fuck them, man. Put all the loot boxes in the game. I don't care. It's like, like I said, just don't make it pay to win. And I think, I think every gamer would be totally cool with that. So they have to very clearly state the odds of getting something good, which is generally between 1% and 2%. You know, so in other words, something costs a dollar, but you have a 1% chance of getting it, you'll spend a hundred dollars to get it. hundred percent. You, know, that, you gotta do a hundred draws. You might get lucky and spend 20 and get, get lucky, but you gotta spend. There are recent games- And you know what happens when you get it after you only spent $20? You put in another 40 to see if you can do it again. hundred percent. Games that have bucked the wave of in-game purchases, mainly console games with a focus on playing a specific role, like IGN's 2023 Game of the Year winner, Baldur's Gate, and PlayStation's blockbuster Spider-Man series. Several of IGN's Game of the Year winners do not have aspects of in-game purchasing outside of downloadable content available for users to buy. However, you take a single-player game and make it into a multiplayer game, people will spend. The backlash towards in-game purchases isn't isolated to just gamers on Reddit. In the UK, Parliament published a response to a call for evidence in July 2022 detailing exactly how game companies can protect children and adults. Those rules include things like loot boxes should be unavailable to children unless they're enabled by a parent or guardian, and all players should be aware of spending controls to support safe and- And I totally agree with this. I totally agree. You, you should have loot boxes be totally unavailable um, to anybody under the age of 18, um, not necessarily under the age. I guess this is kind of where stuff, right? Cause like if a 16, 17 year old has a job and they wouldn't do it, blah, blah, blah. Like you'll have those, whatever. Um, totally fine. Um, and yes, you should absolutely be aware of the spending controls. Is, uh, yeah. Like you need to know that this is gambling a hundred percent. Lock these shit out. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I think this is very simple and responsible gambling. The game industry's response created the UK Interactive Entertainment to enhance player protections in line with the government's response. Showing what the odds are to get the items that you really want, you know, are, is a really good one. So we still see- Yeah, definitely. Um, and I can really only attest to like Rocket League when they had crates going on. But I mean, you knew, uh, I think it's just black markets weren't even in the game. Maybe they were in the game. I guess I totally forget. This was so long ago, but like it told you like you had a 0.5 to 1% chance of getting the highest tier. And then, you know, you did 10 to 20 here. Like it totally fine. I agree. See those mechanics being used quite a bit across the video game industry. And mm -hmm. there's just a lot more transparency around it. And of course, you know, very specific markets have outlawed um, very specific forms of uh, the loot boxes. So I think the regulations are actually in a pretty good place right now. Some yeah, countries WTK, have passed laws with varying degrees of regulation. For example, Italy, South Korea, and the Netherlands require probability disclosures while an outright ban against loot boxes exists in Belgium. As a result, gaming companies have modified their transaction model over time. The industry is really moved. Yeah, I mean, uh, we all need to realize it's gambling, and gambling is going to be scummy as it is, but we don't need to make it, you know, extra scummy. Like, like let's just...
Just keep it to what it is. To more of a, what they call a battle pass system or, or some kind of packaging of seasonal content. And that's found a lot more uh, in terms of a warm response than the, the early days of the loot box. Battle passes are a monetization approach that give gamers the chance to earn skins they normally wouldn't be able to unlock, but can via real-world payments. Fortnite and Call of Duty Warzone excel here. However, these live service games with battle passes require ongoing maintenance, which requires labor and is not cheap to produce. At least one major game publisher told UK regulators in 2023 that a single game and a major franchise cost them more than $1 billion to release, including development and Yeah, I mean, look. Look. Here's the thing. How many of these games that they say cost a billion dollars are actually good games, though? Because, like, in today's day and age, we are starting to see the indie world really, you know, come into full effect, right? We'll take Last Epoch, for example, and, and I could be totally talking out of my ass here. I don't think they spent one billion dollars to sit there and make a great game. And do you know what I hope they do? I hope they come out with a seasonal thing. And I hope they come out with a battle pass that would give me some badass skins for my warlock and whatnot. I hope so. Absolutely. Like, this excuse right here only flies so far. You know what I mean? Marketing expenses. Microtransactions and subscriptions are a way for video game companies to recoup those staggering development costs. Some of the biggest challenges now, I think, is the the, the cost of development Ooh. is increasing. So if you're making a, fucking... you know, a large world, a large open world, and you fill that with very detailed characters, and you want to have the best performance capture in there, uh, that takes you know, a lot of skilled workers. Yeah, this is piercing my ear. Game, this guy's got to stop. Game, and you want to update that every day or every week. That again takes a lot of skilled workers. Games like Fortnite and EA's oh, Ultimate you. Team require maintenance throughout the course of playing through live services, which are frequent content updates throughout the game's life cycle. EA's live services brought in a record $1.71 billion in a quarter ending January 30th, but they're costly to manage, and not all studios are able to bring the live service offerings they had initially planned, like PlayStation, but have still found success with certain games, like Helldivers 2. Well, we're really talking about a live service, a living, breathing game that continues for years and years. Uh, Grand Theft Auto 5 launched in 2013. It's still one of the most played games 11 years later. And in 2025, you know, Grand Theft Auto 6 is going to come out and be the biggest entertainment launch in history. The next development to shift the financial footing in gaming is likely to be the shift from owning a copy of the game to being able to use the game through cloud services. Eventually, someday, we make it to the point where cloud-enabled devices will provide a good enough experience where people are willing to transition over to cloud-based gaming on a more full-time basis. So when that happens, when you don't have the upfront need of a device, then you might see more and more games That'll be crazy. dropping the premium upfront in order to really expand the appeal of the game. Crazy, man. Crazy. Let's see what some of the comments say here. You know, people are going to be fired up. Uh, they keep doing it because y'all keep buying stuff. Eh, exactly. Listen, if you don't want to be a part of the microtransaction stuff, stop buying the battle pass. Plain and simple. Um, the premise that gamers can do nothing about this is not true. Exactly. Like I said, stop buying it. Uh, if people didn't participate in buying microtransactions, this fall wouldn't exist uh, uh, uh so as far as i can keep buying these games yeah i mean everybody knows it's greed plain and simple of, of course but it's also not like you have to realize like why would they not make more money and i think regardless of who this is like, like let's take away from gaming right like let, let's say you're working your job right and they say you're making 20 25 an hour and your boss comes to you and says do you want to make 30, 35, 40 today? Are you going to say no? Are you going to say no? I'm okay. Hard pass. Like, no, you're going to sit there and you're going to take that shit. Come on. Like, I guess you can say it's greed, but it is what it is. Uh, here we go. The old gaming days, of course. Yeah, no, this is a W video. I think, you know, just buy within your means you know what i mean like it's not these gaming companies jobs to make sure that you have ten dollars or twenty dollars every three to six months to buy a new battle pass um or it's not their job to babysit you because you can't stop gambling on loot crates and stuff like you're a fucking adult obviously what they said with the kids stuff is a hundred percent true um 
the young kids and stuff like that they they should not be um getting into that kind of stuff unless you know parents signed off and and even when we get to that point i don't think most like younger kids um should be getting into it regardless but when you're 16 17 once you start having your own job and shit and you want to sit there and start gambling on the on the loot boxes go for it but like you can't sit there and complain that oh i lost 200 dollars and i didn't get one of the rare skins it is what it is <laughs>